All right, guys, welcome. This is the Football Truth Podcast, episode 12. Happy to have Coach Carly Carly Owens onto the platform. She is a wealth of knowledge into human biomechanics movement and just ultimately expressing your full potential on the field as a as a live, living, yes, sir. <laughs> flesh and blood human being. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Happy. Well, I guess we're recording this on St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I'm right. excited to talk football, football, <laughs> movement, yeah. anything, you know, sports, life, all the good stuff. So thank you so much for having me on here. Yeah, my pleasure. And so quickly, what's tell me, what is the biggest thing that you see holding back your athletes or or just like any athlete in general? Um, I would say the biggest thing is the time they spend away or what their habits or movement habits are looking like away from their time in their sport. Mm -hmm. Um, so not just the dedicated training times or spaces, practicing games, but really their habits outside of that sport, holding them back mm -hmm. the way that they're spending their downtime, resting, waiting, um, and just those, those habits that maybe see, ve seem very, uh, minuscule and minute, but play a huge role in how you perform in in your sport they really really do so it seems like mm. the awareness is missing there a lot of times the second we leave that training or sport environment um so that seems to be the biggest glaring thing that i've noticed across the board i work with a lot of different athletes not just soccer but um mm. kind of broad in my niche i wish i did have maybe a specific one but i'm pretty broad in that because yeah. i found that movement matters for everyone and everyone is <laughs> in, in yeah, pain <laughs> having some issues so um but across the board just the daily things that we're doing away from our dedicated training whether it's fitness or sports specific uh game time practice plays a huge role mm, yeah i have to agree it's it's quite funny because you know like you have these pro athletes and they go into their facility and they do like mm -hmm. an hour and a half of this and then they do like half an hour of something else and then they and, and then they eat lunch and then they're back home and they're playing xbox and then they're mm -hmm. just like almost undoing that like mm -hmm. two hours of work with like 18 plus hours of just nonsense, right. you know, right. The majority of time away from that sport. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's an, uh, how do you, how, how do you get athletes to kind of realize that to, to mm -hmm. trigger that or, um, it really does come down with the one-on-one -on -one relationship and communication. Yeah. So it, you know, it tends to, but like with anyone and just, really asking them about their lifestyle <laughs> a lot of questions a lot yeah, of questions. questions what are you doing on your downtime uh what's your favorite hobby what's your favorite food like kind of almost uh side swiping the main or i guess what's the right way to put this kind of um sneak attack sneak attack a little bit in getting to the bottom or root causes of, of what their actual day-to-day -day looks like so mm. um yeah, definitely just making sure I'm asking what's going on on a daily basis, how they're feeling, and kind of picking out key pieces from there so we can move forward really, really well, or just navigate that a little bit better together. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a good thing you brought up questions. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people need to be asked questions of so then they so then they come to those realizations that maybe they're not doing the right stuff, right without without right. telling them directly you know <laughs> right you're kind of guiding them to it's you can really affect change so much uh faster or just you know when people can come to those conclusions themselves so yeah, you're yeah. you know the answer but instead of just telling someone like a parent you have to do this yeah, yeah. letting them create the answers find the answers and then they will be more uh confident with that moving forward to make a change just you know having that awareness on their own goes a long way versus just kind of telling people what what's going well, yeah. on well yeah they they ultimately think that it's that it that it's their own idea and that's a brilliant because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean everyone has an ego some bigger some yeah. smaller but more yes. or less like, you, like i'm like you want to think that like you figured it out you know right <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely so keeping the door open a lot of communication and then just building that relationship from there can really help with those positive changes. Um, and that way the door is open for you to be able to come through and educate or guide or bring more awareness mm. to, to the daily habits, you know, to make those positive changes and impacts. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So first of all, 
how did you get started in sports? Like, what did you first play when you were like four years old? Mm -hmm. We were talking a little bit before this, but um, you're and I, if if your audience knows your backstory really well, it's, it's very similar to mine. I feel very fortunate and lucky that activity and movement has played such a pivotal role in my life. It's come very natural to me because my, my parents were both athletes growing up everyone in my family has just been naturally athletic. So I I am very fortunate in that regard where kinesthetic awareness has always kind of been there for me because I realize now as an adult that that's missing a lot of times in in certain populations of people. And so playing sports growing up was really impactful for me. So at four years old, I think I was probably doing the same thing as you running around very free, very barefoot a lot when Mm. I look back at old videos and pictures and soccer, soccer was in my life from an early, early age. And my mom played soccer growing up. So we were just always kicking the ball around. And those are some of my earliest memories were running around at the track, running around at the beach. I also grew up in California. So we were out at the beach a lot and playing soccer. My friends just always, always touching a ball, playing around the house. Um, No matter what it was, any kind of sport, uh, my hand eye coordination, not great, but uh, (laughs) I, that's why, you know, I tend to take to the sports that I can use my feet more. So uh, soccer and just running and free play was very uh, big in my life at four years old and and till now still to this day. So, (laughs) and uh I'm sure that you that you found that that background and actually playing a lot of sports growing up has has helped you a lot as a coach to actually know what's going on with your with your athletes. Oh, yes. Being able to relate to an athlete is, I think, very important as a coach. They can, it's automatic trust, you know, mm-hmm. kind of been there, been through the grind, been through the daily, you know, especially in my older years, I ended up running collegiately and we were up every morning at 4 a.m. So a lot of discipline, a lot of resilience, a lot of time management. And so being able to speak to my athletes with that background is very helpful. It is easy to build trust that way and and resonate and relate to to their highs and their lows. Cause it is, you know, an ebb and flow when you are an when you are an athlete, there's a lot of demands on you mentally and physically. So it's nice to be able to relate to people in that way. And uh, I just love the competitive nature. Um, Like I said, I have a wide niche of people I work with, but I do tend to gravitate towards working with everyone in the sense that we are all movers. We're all athletes. You know, it's that that inner Mm -hmm. athlete is in us. Maybe we didn't grow up playing sports, but I always approach my coaching with every single person I work with that you're an athlete. So that's those Mm -hmm. same qualities of an athlete we can really bring into our, our dynamic as an athlete and a coach. Yeah, it's it's so important, and I, I oftentimes find it astounding how many <laughs> coaches are not athletes, we'll say, <laughs> or, how, or, or how many coaches don't have that much experience or right. or never even got close to the highest level, mm-hmm. and then yet are telling top athletes how they should walk or run or train or <laughs> everything. Yeah, I yeah, there, there's a it, there's an interesting quality about that because there is so much technology now which is very helpful but Mm. also we get super wrapped up in these you know data points and uh, programming and plotting and game plans and so we can analyze be super analytical with things that people then can take to coaching but again if you've never played or you've never really been someone in that environment when it does come to athletics specifically Mm. um, sports and competitive sports at that high level that you're talking about it, it is just something about you not being, if you've never been there, it's hard. It is hard. That trust isn't maybe there as much. You yeah. don't really know what I'm going through. You don't know what my body's feeling. So it just kind of builds up this natural wall between this energy wall that can just make mm. it hard to progress <laughs> forward. It's, it can be very challenging. I felt that way. Um, I had some club coaches back in my youth where um, I was performing for the coaches that had the experience. And then mm-hmm. there was a big, in my club, there was a big switch. And I, I did have a coach that is exactly kind of what you're talking about, was really good on paper as far as being able to come up with these perfect game plans. But that's not real life. Yeah. It doesn't happen. It doesn't ever happen how you want it to happen. Never does. And there's just something missing about the vision on the field, what we should be kind of gravitating towards um even just things like who to sub in and out like little things like that knowing a athlete's talent and when is the right time to sub a person in and out if you've never played you're you're missing that awareness and so that played a big role in our season and it was really unfortunate and even in a from a nutrition standpoint 
when I got into college and worked with a nutritionist, this was someone who, again, had never really had never competed as an athlete and mm. maybe was not presenting the most most uh, natural or healthiest version of themselves either. So it was really hard for me to take what they were saying and want to embody it and go apply it and really trust it. Because mm. again, there was just, something was off, something was missing. It was really hard to relate to that person. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. And and like you mentioned, all the technology, like mm. so many pro teams and, and obviously also college division one teams, they have all this, uh, they, they have a budget for all this uh, like sports tracking information and they have some kind of like grad student doing sports science. Mm. And I always saw that. It was so interesting because like looking at all the stats, I'm like, these stats don't mean anything Yeah, <laughs> because it's like, the, it's like the guys with the best stats are like not the best players on the field yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah. and then and then i mean even even the good coaches also know this because they have to win or else they get fired you know right right yeah whoever is performing in game time is coming up with those results is who is gonna play who's gonna yeah, play exactly and, and then even on, on top of that like the guys with the best numbers in the gym usually were not oh. there were not starters <laughs> They're on, on the bench. Oh, no, that's a whole, yeah, we can, that's a topic right there for sure. Just the nuances between what is happening in the gym setting and what is happening in athletics is mm -hmm. is just missing the mark big time. Mm -hmm. And I found always found it interesting because um, I am someone that I found myself injured just like, you know, you did. I did find my way to the gym because um, it was a, a, a safe place for me at a certain yeah. point because – I wasn't able to play soccer. I wasn't able to run because I had um, that classic hip impingement that nobody mm. could figure out what was going on. I know why. Uh, I was not glute dominant. I was not back chain dominant. I was yeah. all in the front. But, you know, I found the gym because I could see progress. I could. I felt strong. Aesthetically, I started to develop more and it gave me an outlet. But at the back end of that, it did start, I, and I initially found some initial strength, which helped my hip a little bit more. Um, it did pull me back in some ways as far as pulling my hips back and just or just that kinesthetic awareness grew a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But then, like with all things, I found myself continuing to get hurt. I was the most fit I had ever been as far as what we look at as numbers in the gym, pulling good uh, classic resistance training numbers. I was stronger yeah. than the aesthetics were there and yet <laughs> was still hurt still could not go yeah. play soccer because my hip was still pinching or i'd pull my quad it's crazy my quad would just seize up on me all the time wow. hamstring twinges all these things were just happening constantly and i just kind of wore that pain that uh pain badge of honor because well i'm just it's just part of it it's that wear and tear is part of yeah, it I'm working it's, it's like part of the game huh it's part of it but in reality, having to kind of take a look, hard look in the mirror and say, what am I actually doing? So I always found it interesting once I did have that awareness and big picture perspective mm -hmm. of gym training and classic gym training. I'm talking about like the barbell, Olympic, yeah. powerlifting type of training with athletics and that forward motion. You know, most athletes are either running, walking, throwing, swinging, all that rotational stuff, spiraling, mm. and there just was a disconnect. And so um, it was really amazing to me when I started working with more, especially high, high school athletes, but also collegiate athletes, and they would bring me their summer programs. Mm. And no matter what their gender, age, sport, they all had essentially a foundation of Olympic weightlifting yeah, as a heavy, heavy part of their training. And we would get really, really good at doing our stuff over the summer, but then I'd send them back to school and mm. back pain would come back. Yeah. You know, they'd start having all these little issues, some sciatica from going back. Now they're in school, they're sitting down a lot, all these little things. Mm -hmm. And it just was super interesting to me that we would, we would just go from being really strong in the summer and then we lose that really quickly or all their programs were this general blanket Olympic lifting as just a, I, I'm not really sure like when, well, I know when that started kind of becoming a thing, but it was interesting. I mean, why is this sport, all these other sports strength program? It doesn't make, it just never makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. So very interesting that, uh, you know, you're seeing it a lot. I mean, a lot of us as coaches, as movement coaches or mm -hmm. cons consults are starting to see this. And I hope we can bring awareness to these athletes to, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you want to stay healthy 
and on the field and in, you know, your uh, available availability out mm-hmm. there, you want to make sure you preserve that as much as possible and, and continue doing what you love. And so it's like, okay, we have to ask ourselves, do I love soccer? And am I wanting to just play soccer or do I love bench press? Those yeah, two yeah. Things, while, you know, you might love both, but they're not going to be helping, helping each other out. So <laughs> what are we willing to risk for one versus the other? I guess that was a long ramble. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> spot on. I mean, there was a few things there. Like for sure, in myself, and I'm sure like you can relate and many athletes, like we like kind of lose sight on the end goal, like on the end mission, it is to get right. better at your sport. Right. Because like we get caught up in, okay, I'm going to master this exercise in the gym. Mm-hmm. And we assume that thing transfers over into forward locomotion on the field. Mm-hmm. When, if you look a bit deeper, pro- pro- it probably doesn't and actually mm-hmm. probably and actually probably leaves you more open to injury mm-hmm. and and also it, like most like d1 programs the uh like strength coach usually doesn't have a background in actually playing d1 athletics mm-hmm. and, and and then if they do oftentimes it's not in your sport mm-hmm. where you know like a a like american football a, an american football a strength coach doing stuff for soccer is like night and day yeah. you know because in yeah. football you're like you're um in american football you're you are pushing an external force in mm-hmm. soccer that doesn't really happen unless you like unless you like count the ball <laughs> you know like, like yeah um, like yeah. doing a kick or something but <clears throat> to me it was crazy that ball I mean, is like, usually pretty light compared yeah like, usually it's like i mean a size five it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's full of air so we don't need a max press <laughs> kick it out there yeah, um exactly. yeah and i noticed that a lot too i think the first time i started i think that's why i didn't have any major catastrophic injuries was because at the time going through high school females especially were not uh you know we just didn't go into the weight room as often it wasn't as common as it is now so now female athletes which is very empowering I'm all for female strength and empowerment which is amazing especially in athletics I love it however want to make sure that we're able to show up for uh our ourselves our family our friends and our sport without that wear and tear without the breakdown so Mm -hmm. I noticed it for the first time I think my senior year in college as a like I said a collegiate runner and a distance runner so cross country and even in track some of those longer distances and we finally they had us come into the weight room we go into the weight room maybe once every two months three months (laughs) and the strength conditioning coach didn't know what to do with us so same thing they have us doing these just random movements. I don't, I think some single leg RDL kind of stuff, just yeah. random little things that really did not. <laughs> I, I re- even remember at that time thinking, okay, am I doing this right? Like, what is this supposed to feel like? I don't really He's know. Like, uh, I think so. <laughs> yeah. It was just kind of, you, you could tell that they were kind of, especially the, the male coach was just, all right, I don't know what to do. With these cross country runners just you know, they should just go run, I guess. So we'll just make them do these kind of little movements here and there and send yeah. them on their way. It kind of was just a check off the list to exactly. do their duty as in that, um, that division one school. And so it's funny to look back on that. Like this does not really apply to me at all. Some of these things. And I think, you know, we athletes, they, they do, they, they are trusting people who on paper are supposed to be the experts. Yeah, yeah high, high education, high authority. So we kind of go in blindly trusting like, well, this person's a doctor, this person, you know, or this person's gone through for strength conditioning, they are going to help me get stronger. We just have to think what is we have to redefine health and strength. Because yeah, yeah. I've, I've worked with many of people who are aesthetically huge, you would look at them and whoa, they are fit, they're in shape, they must you know, be athletic. They must know mm-hmm. what they're doing. And then they're hurt. They have low chronic back pain. They have hip impingement. They have all tech, that shoulder, you mm-hmm. know, they're constantly having their shoulder have problems, all kinds of things. So what is actual strength? What is health? And what is going to keep you in your sport for the long haul? Because mm-hmm. you, know, you could be, like you said, those numbers in the weight room, but if you're on the bench or you're out hurt, you're not serving your team. You're not going to have fun out there. It's going to be sad it's gonna be a sad time i it was a it was a sad time being hurt and i was just oh yeah running 
I mean, you probably felt that big time. It is so, it's just gut wrenching as an athlete. That's all we love to do. We love performing. And if mm -hmm. we can't perform, what are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah. Here? Like so, as an athlete, if you can't play your sport, you are literally failing at the core mm -hmm. purpose. <laughs> right. And that was, that was my experience. You know, after I, after I like tore my ACL in college and I was out for like, out, I was out for like a year and a half. And, um, I got some heat on Instagram for this post about this topic, <laughs> but, but I was saying, you know, yeah. as an injured athlete, you are the most useless person on the team <laughs> Yeah, because you I mean, can't help your teammates in training to be like a, I'm like a sparring partner to, to make sure right. that like the starters are like on point. Right. And then, and then as right. a starter, oh, obviously if you're on the field, then, then you, then you can't help your team win the game. And, and, right. and you're, and you're up in the stands utilizing team resources, you know, well, you're not helping yeah. the team get better. So, right. And it's a hard pill to swallow, but oh, it is hard, you know, yeah. it, a goal. And I, that's why I also, when I found your uh, Instagram, I was like, oh my gosh, yes, this, this is it. <laughs> like not afraid. I need to do a little bit better. And I'm, I'm, you know, kind of, that will come with time. Um, but pr putting more on like actually posting like that, cause it is mm -hmm. very effective. It, it jars and it makes the athlete think we have to think. Yeah, I know sometimes please. we get caught up in just, um, you know, this kind of cycle of we're tired, we're exhausted. We got to wake up. We got to go to practice. We got to train. We got to do school. And then we got to, or, you know, if they are in the professional, we got, you, you're doing a lot of things. Maybe you have mm. to participate in um, events and then you have to go back and train some more. It's just this recurring thing. Yeah. So we just are trusting our team trusting our team. Okay. Who's going to, where's my fuel coming from? Am I hydrated? Okay, cool. I got the, you know, the team's got all the station set up, whatever. Okay. Now I'm at practice. I got to hit the trainer to roll me out. I got to hit the ice. We're just trusting our team. I got to go do my strength training. Cause that's what I'm told. It's on my schedule, yeah, but right. it's okay to slow down and think. And that way you are really asking like, is this serving me? There's, there's three questions that we like to, um, my squad and I like to ask people and it's when it comes to exercise or what we're doing, does this thing I'm doing help me feel strong? Okay. There's a lot of things out there that people could argue, make them feel strong, including mm. Olympic lifting. Yeah, does sure. This make me feel strong? sure. Yeah. It's feeling something. I get this adrenaline rush, you know, all these endorphins and hormones rush to my body when I pick up something heavier than I, that I couldn't pick up yesterday. But then the other two questions is this healthy? Like, can I leave this session or can I leave what I'm doing and feel like I can come back to this every day? Does my body feel good? Do I feel mm -hmm. energized? Am I sleeping well? Am I feeling fueled and, and good out there when I'm running around at practice and in the games? Like, am I able to, to sustain that? Mm -hmm. And then is this natural? So as we talk about spirals all the time, is this the natural way that my body for as humans did for thousands of years, is this nat these natural inputs, are they expressing themselves in my body? And so if the answer is no, it's okay to think and also be empowered to speak up and tell someone, this does not make me feel good. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do this. I need a different option, you know, whatever that is. And I think people are scared to do that sometimes, but it's important and it's empowering. So being able to empower our athletes is huge, especially yeah, those yeah. professionals, you know, you're, you're, I mean, you are paying for, I mean, you're getting paid really good money to perform on the field. Like you mm. said, so your asset is your body and you mm. need to make sure that you're doing all the things that you can to allow it to perform. Like you said, not be stuck injured out there. Yeah. And so sometimes it, it comes down to really having to take some time and slow down and think about what you're doing. And questioning or speaking up against you know something that you don't feel is true to you and that can be very hard that can yeah be very, no, it's, very it's hard. not easy at all because there's so much pressure in politics from the mm -hmm. club from physios from mm -hmm. agents from even from parents sometimes it just obviously depends on on your family yeah. but like for me working with like pro guys like the biggest hurdle to get over is they have to realize that if they get injured and they can't play, the club is not going to offer them an extension to their current contract. And that means yeah. they will not have money to pay the bills or, or like support their family. Mm -hmm. And the physio that did stuff to try and help you that actually caused your injuries is not going to lose his job. 
Yeah. He'll be there. He'll be there fine when the club replaces you and brings in a right. different player who's younger and has less of an injury history. Yeah. And you, you know, like just like fresh meat, you know? Yeah. And so mm-hmm. once players, once players realize that, then they can take so much more uh, responsibility in their mm-hmm. performance and their health and ultimately get themselves closer to their best, uh, yeah. best potential. Yeah. And you hope that these younger players coming up because so much information is out there now or people talking about this and, or the ability to contact maybe, maybe players who have, uh, lasted so long in their, in their athletic career and just being able to say, Hey, what are you doing? Yeah. You know, like you said, take ownership of what you're doing and reach out to these people who are thriving and haven't had long injury lists and see, what are you doing? What did you, have you been doing? Cause I need to do that. <laughs> I need to do that because and then notice what the people are doing that are getting hurt a lot and then do the opposite. of <laughs> Yeah. Like stop doing the things. that. And I know we see it. Yeah. I know we see it because we're constantly looking at film and footage and that's our job, right? We are coaches and we're observers, but even as athletes, just look, you know, take some time. I know we're always on Instagram. People are, like you said, video games are a very common theme. I don't know if you've noticed that a lot, but especially my yeah. football players, they love oh, I know. To it's crazy. play video games. So what is, you know, take time and start observing a little bit more environments and how people are living their life outside of their sport. And there are definitely common patterns you will start to see in the people that are just battling injury after injury after injury. And there's patterns that you'll see on the polar opposite of that, where people are resilient. They're not breaking down as quickly. And so I know we've noticed those things. And now we're encouraging others to also, it was a little bit of work. It's a little bit of work, but it's so worth it. It's so worth it to to be free of pain. (laughs) It's crazy. Yeah. It's a, it is kind of funny having to almost, uh, (laughs) almost force people to do what's best for them. Yeah. And yeah. Because because oftentimes people aren't won't or can't do it on their own for what for the whatever reason, you know something in their psychology is not letting them get mm-hmm. to that point where they start making change in their life. And uh, mm-hmm. I just wanted to mention, like when you mentioned like video games, I had a uh, a pro client that was literally on like Twitch for like hours every night. Mm-hmm. And I'm like. And I'm like, dude, I told you to like wear like blue blockers at night and like <laughs> and and go to bed at like 10 p.m. And you're here on Twitch for four hours while your career is falling apart. You're like 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 you're not scoring goals. Like I'm mean, your team yeah. might like, like your team might loan you out. Like what? <laughs> like what? Yeah. What do I have to do? What is the you priority? Know? What is the priority? And it takes yeah. that coach to step in. And again, I think sometimes too whether it's athletes or general population, just because I notice this across the board, it really doesn't matter if you're an athlete or not. That same thing kind of comes into play. We just kind of go, we're just in our routine and there can be that separation of that athletic career and their downtime, but it's, we know it goes hand in hand. And so what is the priority? Is it soccer or football or Mm -hmm. is it Twitch, you know, and having to have those questions, that's the question. And then, they have to either own up to that or be okay with then letting that other part of their life fade away. Cause it will fade away. It just will. That's yeah. If, if you don't, <laughs> if you don't work on it, you don't do, do things yeah. to, to the right things. It's not going to happen for you. Sorry. Right. And plus, right. I mean, there's, there's thousands, there's millions of other kids that want to be pros. So there's, there's always going to be some talented, mm-hmm. uh, like talented 18 year old that, is mm-hmm. ready to take your spot so yeah, like the, mm-hmm. there's there's really no no margin yeah if you're if you're at that level just take advantage of it i mean i know it's easier said than done it's like yeah I, of course i'm happy to be here i appreciate it but soak it in and do everything you can to stay there because like you said it is such a great opportunity mm-hmm. and kids are dreaming of those opportunities so do everything in your power to capitalize on that because it's you know you will age eventually you will age out and you want to be able to look back and be happy with where you've come and what you were doing you don't want to have any regret or i wish i would have i wish i would have gone to bed at 10 dang i wish i would have done this or that so simple things these little adjustments you can do on your own at home or away from your sport i call them daily doses 
Mm -hmm. simple little doses of simple adjustments. We're not talking crazy. We're not asking you to change the world, but little things that can add up and protect your career and your body forever. It just, it's so worth it. So, you know, I hope people can hear that. (laughs) Yeah, please, please. And and that, that kind of carries over to, um, I wanted to talk to you about the prevalence of, uh, of ACL tears, not not only just across the board, but but specifically in the female sports in college. Mm-hmm. Because I remember a lot, uh, like every like every women's soccer team like would like have four or five ACL tears a, a season. And right. I'm like you and like there's like a roster of 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 injured girls on the on the sidelines. Like, <laughs> like what is going yeah. on? Yeah. Again, I'm very fortunate and lucky that I did not suffer from that, but I have many friends who have, um, not even mm-hmm. just in younger ages, but I've had friends, even recently, one of them who was playing women's soccer just out on a Sunday, you know, we just play pickup or whatever. And so, mm-hmm. um, just tore her ACL in that I had a girl and that was my friend from high school. And so she was playing and experienced that. I had another girl on my team, uh, last year, I watched it. I literally was on the sideline. I had just come out as a sub happened right in front of me. Mm -hmm. And so it's really coming down to, yeah, what is happening? And I just noticed whether it is soccer. Um, I find that sports, uh, change of direction, you know, that quick change of direction in female sports that are mostly, I'd say soccer, lacrosse, field hockey. Those ones are really prevalent with ACL injuries through the, I mean, they're just continuing to increase and, when you start observing the videos of when they happen or, or even then looking at how these girls, because usually of course you have to look at their movement before uh, that happens. Yeah, Cause it might adjust. Yeah. They're, they're going to be down and out for a while after that, but um, they're, they're resting postures. They're walking and they're running. It really is poor loading mechanics across the board. Yeah. So there's just no awareness of how to utilize proper tension, that fascia tension and loading loading just seems to be not a thing for for female athletes and men tend to i have a it seems like the women i work with we have to really get them opening and loading properly safely securely backside strong side so getting Mm -hmm. the glutes to come online loading everything out so opening in their squat for example um i use that that kind of common word but that bow shape just think bow shape opening whereas men have the hard hard time with the opposite they're usually so muscle bound and tight and restricted Mm. that they can't internally rotate so that ability to release energy or leave the ground or get around the corner that is missing so it's really these two different these two different kind of bodies that present themselves but for women especially it's that quick change of direction poor foot mechanics and poor hip loading there's no awareness of how to utilize the body with good tension good pressure absorption and so mm. everything just collapses and caves in it's just kind of gummy yeah, yeah. out there giraffe baby basically when they go to <laughs> when they go to pressurize and then so then the training comes down to okay now well we, we have an acl problem but all the classics training i see with with most women is a lot of single leg balance but same thing all favoring kind of the front side of our body and no awareness of how to pull back so even if we think okay these it's just very segmented very segmented we got to get the quad strong we got to get this strong so it's very big muscle segmented and we're just jamming into these areas but it's not translating to dynamic movement on the field Mm -hmm. it's just not translating and it's it's causing problems that way so we're we're slamming a lot into joints we're superficially trying to strengthen Mm -hmm. but the movement piece the integration and the application back into the real life forward motion the walk and the run is just Mm -hmm. not translating and so that seems to be um, the biggest thing with women that i notice especially Mm -hmm. it's not good (laughs) yeah is there's like like how how strong are you if you can't uh absorb force and then you, and, and then mm-hmm. your and then your joints break down over time like it doesn't matter how strong like like your quad is or how strong your right. glute is if you if like you target it specifically as opposed to a more holistic a glute mm-hmm. c- connection and that having the actual right biomechanics mm-hmm. and the right like and the right uh quality of tissue 
mm-hmm. versus like mm-hmm. just trying to force the glutes to activate like with band work and other like like yeah. a machine work and stuff like that yeah a lot of times especially young kids or younger athletes they don't really learn that kinesthetic awareness of how to load properly like you said absorb unless they're under so we rely on that external load we'll we'll mm. throw stuff on their backs really quickly because then it forces <laughs> them to have to control something yeah, but yeah. the way i teach people is i mean we we should be able to maximize what we're doing and with just our body even and you should feel those things when you are walking or running if you're dedicating time for that you should feel these really strong patterns every step every stride should feel fluid and smooth. And then when you are actually maybe playing a sport or you're hanging out with your friends and you're recessing, as I call it, you should express these patterns at a certain point. Naturally, you should not be thinking you don't want to be on the field. Hmm. I hope I don't tear my ACL out here. Okay. I'm I'm about to come up to the ball and I'm going to pivot. And you're not going to be thinking about your patterns when you're on the field. So Mm. your habits for better or worse are going to show up out there. So you want your subconscious to just be defaulting to secure, strong movements so Mm. that you don't break down. And that comes with the time, you know, your, those daily habits that we talked about at the beginning that you're, you're doing in your time away from the, the, pitch or field or court or whatever sport it is and the training you want your training to feed the strongest patterns the strongest movements and you all these other things strength length you know flexibility um athleticism and aesthetic even are really cool byproducts of moving really well and consistently you're able to play your Mm -hmm. sport and you're feeling good You're able to show up every day. Then you're able to condition, you're able to get touches on the ball. You're able to do these little things that allow you to be this most elite elite athlete. So, um, yeah, just empowering kids to kind of feel, just get back into their body. I don't think there's a lot of time spent. What does my body feel like? What does it feel like when I take a step? What does it feel like when I'm hanging out at home? What, how am I hanging out at home when I'm resting? So these little things, that should be brought to attention. And I think just even in athletics and the fitness world the industry, we're really, we are big on habit building, you know, just like I, I like to use those analogies with juggling, you know, you mm-hmm. touches on the ball, just little touches on the ball here. And it's the same thing with movement, your body, you know, you have to get in good quality movement to build the strong habits and the connections, just like you're trying to drink enough water, get enough sleep, like all these habits and mm-hmm. exercise or training is important, but it's not just what you're doing. It's that how, like that how component plays a big, big role. And so, um, yeah, I hope that more female athletes, I'd love to be able to show more female athletes how to feel strong in their loading positions without, without hip thrusting. <laughs> yeah, I know. The, I, I catch fire a lot on the internet. thrusting is you, the worst. It's the Yeah. So just you get, like a like. You get fire, I'm sure. I get fire. For the second girl, people are so triggered. They will live, they will live and die by the hip thrust. So, oh, I know. I'll, I'll, so I'll, uh, a funny story on that is after my, after my ACL tear and after all the rehab stuff, I was like still having a bunch of like patellar uh, mm-hmm. uh, um, irritation and stuff. And uh, like my like strength coach at, at my D1 school, he was having me like load up a lot on like barbell hip thrusts, um, deadlifts, barbell back squat, front squat, all that. And like, mm-hmm. I could literally barbell hip thrust four plates on each side. So, <laughs> I mean, doing the math, that's 45 times eight. That's, <laughs> that's a lot. Well, that's that's a almost lot. like <laughs> 400 pounds plus the, uh, the bar. And yeah. I, you know, I have big, strong looking glutes, but at that point, uh, and, and and guys, like, um, this is way before all the fascist stuff. I had never felt yeah. my glutes on the field. <laughs> I've never felt Same. my glutes when I run. Same. I've never, mm-hmm. I've never felt, felt my glutes when I pass the ball, when I dribble, when I shoot, mm-hmm. which you should, because it's, it's like the most powerful muscle in your so body. powerful, body. yeah. And to me, that whole idea, I was like, hold on. I do all <laughs> this, like, strength work in the gym. To get these yeah. huge, powerful glutes, and then I've yeah. I've never actually felt them on the field, and I I realized yeah. that other guys they're like, oh yeah, like you don't have like like you don't feel your glutes on the field, and like these are like, <laughs> and these are like five foot three, uh, Hispanic players, super skinny, yeah. and yeah. but they're but they're better players, <laughs> yeah. And then that yeah. was the beginnings of me realizing, okay, maybe there's something different in the tissue, yeah. in the quality of the tissue, as opposed to just 
okay, how much can this muscle group lift in this certain range right. of motion under a certain with this exercise? Yeah, with this you know, exercise. Am I really good at hip thrusting? Okay, great. I'm really good at hip thrusting. Yeah. But that's not serving me out there. Yeah, I, yeah. It's funny you say that because that hits home, it hits just home so 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 much, so spot mm-hmm. on. Because same thing. Uh, I had never. That's why I think my quads were just blowing up. I was all I was that quad. Oh, you're just you're just quad dominant. That's quads. Yeah. Like all show, no go. Because it was just all in my quads. Yeah, um, front, yeah. Cap, yeah, all hip. That's why I was having so much hip problem, hip pain all the time. And then I think two years ago or so when I really started maybe a little bit more since I started adjusting my way of training and moving and the way I coach, then I go back and play soccer again. And the next day I remember going out and the next day my glutes were sore. My hamstrings were sore. It's like, I've literally never felt this before. That is mm-hmm. insane. That is crazy. And same thing. Yeah. I was trying everything to activate be strong yeah, activate. tons of, um, in my, in my PT that I was doing before when I had gotten hurt from running, I was doing a lot of hip flexor. I have to strengthen your hip flexors are just probably weak. You got to strengthen your hip flexor. So tons yeah, of yeah. single leg bridging yeah. as well. And all kinds of lunging variations, all kinds of step ups, all kinds of things. I was Everything, trying, yeah. I would search for it and it just was not actually helping me when I would go to express natural forward movement. And I would go mm-hmm. to run or walk. It's just not serving me. So it's so mind blowing and crazy that it's just interesting to hear your connection with that too. Cause yes, so crazy mm-hmm. to feel yeah. the difference, to actually feel the difference yeah. out there. Cause, cause then you actually realize what, well, hold on. This is what it, fe- this is what it feels like to be athletic. <laughs> yeah. Faster. And... You feel faster. You can change direction faster. Yeah. You're, you're able to read, you're not, you're not wasting time. You don't even realize it, but you're not wasting time self-correcting. The, the poor mechanics. Yeah, trying to like, body's doing trying to like that manage for you. it all on the fly. Yeah. 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 So you're just able to perform just even better. It's very freeing. It's really, really cool. To feel yeah. That. And just play your sport that you love, not have to worry about mm-hmm. trying to activate your glutes when you like change direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I have a funny story also like, yeah. uh, and also I'm sure some guys might hate on this, but you know, there I've had consults with uh, soccer players that have spent a lot of time doing a lot of the knees over toes uh mm. do, like the world of training mm. and they have a, they have extremely strong hamstrings extremely strong mm. glutes inside the sandbox of the gym inside the sandbox of like nordic curls and other right. uh, things they do there and then i asked these guys so on the field like when you sprint and you run and stuff like have you ever felt your glutes or like your hamstrings or your abs like all like working together Right. And, 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 and I just get like a blank stare, <laughs> like, Yeah. Like, well, you know? Yeah. And that's, yep. that's the integration the, the, and application is missing. That's, that's really what it is. And I think the knees over toes stuff is great because any, I'm, I'm glad they are helping people because anyone yeah. who goes from not being aware, not having any kinesthetic awareness, you start getting more flexible. You start feeding better inputs without sure. the compression is going to be going to be helpful. But then, okay, what are we applying this to? Like we ha- eventually you have to get out of the gym setting. <laughs> eventually yeah, yeah. you have to go to your sport. You have to go live life. And is that actually helping us then? I'm glad it brings people that initial relief, but then I feel like there is that there's something else missing. There's another piece missing because mm-hmm. a lot of it is favoring the front. So a yeah. lot of it is bumping into the front, but that's then we would need to actually go forward and we don't land and step and drive our knee forward. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. a lot of ACL tears probably wouldn't happen as much. But we need to be able to pull back and load back there and then move forward. Like that's that slingshot effect, essentially. And yeah, exactly. That's, I've worked with a lot of people, too, that they have initial relief, but then something's missing. They don't know how to mm-hmm. actually integrate it into their life or sport. Mm-hmm. So then they find themselves back into. And the, uh, the glute kind of missing glue aspect is is very interesting that whole idea of i don't know how to feel my glue unless i have i'm holding a weight is shocking <laughs> shocking yeah and i tried a lot of things too growing up i think the only times i could feel like i was actually using it athletically was when i naturally put myself in positions that allowed me to pull my hips back 
mm-hmm. and load essentially, but I just didn't realize that at the time. So yeah, if I was course. doing banded work where I was doing lateral squat walks, you know, kind of those walks where you're in an athletic stance, moving side to side, or I was st- doing stuff on a stair climber, or we'd be doing, um, we'd be doing hill workouts. Then my glutes would come online because it forced me to be at these angles. That's that right. Exactly. Yeah. Being, it. but we want to be able to feel that when we take a step out of bed, we're ready to go. It's crazy. It really was so eye-opening to me to feel the entire posterior driving me forward, even on a mm. walk now. And it took time and yeah, practice yeah. and how to find that and then drill it into my system. But that to me is shocking because that same thing, just like you, I used to feel my knees, used to feel hip, all these things that did not feel athletic at all. So it was always undoing, undoing those things and then trying to go play. Now it's, you wake up and ready to go. I could step out and go run if I need to, which is crazy. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing is all the top athletes, like every, every athlete knows this guy on their team. Who's like that natural, like who just walks on the Mm -hmm. field, like pulls their shoes on, doesn't even tie his shoe. And he probably just ate like McDonald's or some, or some garbage. And then he just dominates on the pitch. And he, and, and he, he was, he was, he he was probably up till like 2am last night, just doing dumb dumb shit. And it's, but it's like, it just goes to show that like, like the guy who's the grinder doing all this extra, 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 extra stuff usually is not the guy who is doing well. And that was, yeah. that, that was me. Like I was the grinder. And then now this whole journey has become, okay, how can I become that guy who just walks up, who just shows up, you know, like the whole idea of like a, yeah. of like a lion, uh, a lion <laughs> doesn't stretch like, like, yeah, a, they do one stretch and they're ready to go attack. <laughs> they're ready to yeah, go like they're on the prowl. You know, there's not yeah. this. Oh, I'm gonna do like half an hour, like like band yeah. warm up, and then I'm gonna, yeah, all this. All yeah, this shit. we always joke yeah. about that too. We're like, could you imagine? It? We literally have said we were talking about that the other day. Um, I don't know if you follow Coach Bam, but we work very closely together, and you definitely should should because we talk about this stuff all the time. But we were joking about, uh, yeah. Oh man, this this like this leopard like what if they just what if they did like guys wait time out i can't join the hunt yet i got i need a i need a warm up uh, hold on i got to like ice my knee and wait then, <laughs> i got like yeah, i got to sh- <laughs> got to put the uh, icy hot on first hold on <laughs> i got to stretch my back out no and yeah. there's times for that because of just of course the nature of the world that we live in yeah yeah but at least understanding that and having the awareness of that you can balance out those those negative inputs or you know not have to just n- deal with that as on- often, you know, you can mm. kind of scrub that out of your body pretty quick compared to being oblivious. And unfortunately, the most people don't know what they don't know, exactly. but you know, I think it's our job to continue kind of sh- spreading awareness and not being afraid to go against the grain a little bit. It's, it'd be very easy, uh, especially because I tend to be a little bit loud, a little bit crazy. Oh, yeah. I was that person, same thing, like the grinder, default yeah. aggressive, like, and I still am that, but now I'm not injured. So it'd be yeah. very easy <laughs> Even to show up and be that personality to capitalize on trends and grow following and get more, whatever. But it mm. does not sit well. And people are still hurting and people need help and people need people like us, I think, to not be afraid to say, hey, we want to save bodies. <laughs> we yeah. want our athletes to have their bodies healthy and ready to go now and just their entire life. There's not a lot of people, I don't think, that are saying that or they're – because I get it. There's pressures. It, again, you probably – like you said, you yeah. catch heat. I catch plenty of heat. But at the end of the day, I'm sure we can both put our heads down and sleep at night very just rested and and happy knowing that we're speaking our truth and, and helping, I think, actually mm. – trying to make a change because something the current the current way things are going or the current model of health or recovery fitness performance something is missing mm-hmm. something is, is not not meeting the mark so yeah i mean ultimately like if you're an athlete and you're never injured or never hurt and all your training is done outside in nature in the sunlight then you're not a very good customer like for the gyms and for the doctors and the physios oh, of course you know? not. so, no, so of course you know it's I mean? not no, the, yeah. well, I just reading yesterday, low back pain, they're spending, there's that industry for low back pain treatment is $635 billion, yeah, nice. which is like, of course, they're not, no one's trying to cure back pain. Of course not. Yeah, no. Don't cure it. Otherwise you'll lose all that money. No. 
just a little band-aid, a little band-aid, just plug up the hole and keep the customer coming back. But oh, exactly. we're actually exactly. trying to have a solution here. So you don't got to talk about pain. Back pain is not fun. Yeah. And one last point before we can do like a little bit of a, uh, of an anal- of, of analysis mm. that, um, that Carly mm-hmm. wanted to um, show us. Mm-hmm. I think the just one of like the final points is like jaguars or, or, or leopards or tigers, those guys, those animals are not tearing their ACL on the hunt. Right. There's no, no, there's no hamstring pulls. <laughs> <laughs> no. They're no if there are, brains. they're dead. <laughs> yeah. Cause then <laughs> they, they die and they don't pass on their, on their genes and right. you know, <laughs> Right. We really yeah. have to take, two. I think that's the big point that kind of will lead us into some of this, some film. I just pulled together a little bit, a little bit of things that I'll kind of show. And I'm sure it'll be very similar to, you know, what you're talking about a lot with your, your athletes and things, but I like to look at nature and nature involves, yes, animals are fun to look at because they really are unbiased. I mean, they're just doing their thing. Exactly. Even with animals, you can look at animals that are living in modern times that are domesticated, that are That's captured right. versus natural animals. And you will see a very distinct difference there um, with their bodies and movement, but also things like uh, just the most vulnerable of populations. So young children are really great to observe because they are moving innately instinctually. No one is teaching them to, you know, do a lot of these things that they're doing. Uh, I live right near an elementary school. And so when I'm walking by sometimes, When they are let out for recess, it is a whole amazing thing to witness. They are are yelling and screaming. They're so free. They are sprinting. They're jumping. They're climbing. They're crawling. They're doing all these kinds of things. So it's really cool to watch their natural patterns out there when, when they are not being told what to do. They're just doing their thing, whatever movement comes out. And so then I also like to look at, you know, very elderly people that are still thriving in their environments, elite athletes that are not breaking down. And then of course, populations of people that are not living the life of luxuries that we have. So they're not Mm -hmm. sitting in couches. They're not driving around in all the cars that we have. They're not commuting to work all the time. They are very still intact with their natural environment. So I like to look at a lot of populations, just like I'm sure you do too, Mm -hmm. and just see the, the overall trend and patterns. So, um, let me share my yeah, yeah, go ahead. Here and we'll get into I think I know how to do this. Okay. Let me know if this comes up. Well done. Oh wait, not that one. Hold on. Let me stop it really quick. Not that one. I think I did the wrong one. Cable. There should be a cable here. iPhone via cable. Hmm. How come this one? Let's see. Why does it go? It's showing my computer screen, right? Oh, here it comes. There we go. Can you Perfect. see this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We got you. Sweet. Okay, so I'll get to the I, – I have a lot of soccer on here just because I know that's what we're both passionate yeah. about. But, again, just kind of scrubbing through, if you start to just pay attention to these patterns that we have as children, again, these are instinctual things that we naturally develop. So we go into developing strength and kind of our motor skills from an early age when, and our sensory inputs from some tummy time stuff. And then we start to crawl. So we've got really good, strong, you know, foot positioning. We are hips back glute dominant. That is what's driving us forward. We don't see babies doing a lot of max driving from a hip thrust. Yeah, yeah. They do. They're going to their stomachs to then, orient themselves again or rest, but they are hips back. And so I like to take these patterns. I think I just have a couple. I'll go fast on these ones too. Resting positions. The ground is such a safe place. And so for my athletes, and I'm sure you do too, like you said, getting sunlight, getting back to nature, getting back to the ground, we need to get back to the ground more. So for Mm -hmm. your video game athletes, for my video game athletes, you better be playing on the ground. Get out of those chairs that are just compressing you. You see it all the time. And a lot of developmental places talk about the importance of learning to crawl. But then, of course, as adults, we just don't do that. We're just afraid of the ground. Everything we know is off the ground, and we're just not comfortable with it there. So getting back to the ground more often is awesome. And I just love watching little kids crawl because they're just on the go. They're just moving so well with hips back. They'll find their natural resting positions. They'll push themselves up and they've got that kind of spiral out to in motion 
from this early age that no one's teaching them. It's just a natural way that momentum and energy is moving that we yeah. then see, of course, when we go to play sports. So I've got a couple of clips of some young, some young kids and then some uh, older athletes. But this little girl is my spirit animal. She is so adorable. She's just schooling everybody. So fluid, light on her feet, touch and go, you mm -hmm. know, and then she walks away. And I think she, she kind of has that, that swag about her too. She knows. She knows what's going on, but even as she comes to the ball, they're just really nice shapes, top to bottom. Just really, and and correct me if I'm wrong here too, but when you talk about spiraling or momentum, do you use specific words uh, to describe loading out or do you stick with like glute dominant? What's your oh, go-to? Well, and there's like the bow in the corner, obviously. And then, mm -hmm. and then, the, cause like the way I, the, the way I talk about it is like the spiral movement is like layered on top of the fascial connections. Yes. Yeah. Cause like, because like, for example, like you can have someone who's fascial driven, but they're right. still not that great at moving in spirals. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. 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 You can get away with some of that stuff if you're very, you know, if your fascia is, is intact. So I like to look at both of those things. Yeah, yeah. Usually if there's collapsing or just how free they can move too. Yeah. Like you said, it's, and it's not looking for perfection again, cause most of these people have never even heard of spiraling or bows or corners. They're just doing whatever feels the most natural, yeah. but there's a way the body will start to just make sure it's protecting itself, whether it's how the feet are absorbing impact or, or what's driving them. So never having to like nitpick unless I was doing an assessment on someone to mm -hmm. really show them why they're having some problems, but it's just fun to see little kids out there just being super fluid. This little guy love how he moves. Is really strong with his footwork and, and confidence out there yeah. off the ball, changing direction. I mean, there's no, the biggest thing too, especially when, it, when you look at people who have been in the gym for a long time, that bracing, that tension, that restriction, there's mm -hmm. not a lot of movement, that fluidness. And cause we lose it. We just start to tense up, brace your core, yeah. all these kind of classic. Oh keys yeah. That all the core bracing is crazy. Yeah. I want to slap myself. Cause I used to say that to people all the time, but. Now I see, you know, your elbows can move freely, your shoulder, your yeah, hip, yeah. everything is kind of able to move freely. I think that's a huge component. And, you know, again, because of the nature of us sitting in chairs for so long, we might not be able to fluidly spiral perfectly, but that's okay. You don't have to be, we're not, we're human. We're not looking for perfection, but we should be able to take tumbles and pop back up and not have these catastrophic things that are happening. Exactly. So I love watching little kids playing and just expressing what comes so easily to them. This little girl, Lillian, Lil Lillian, she is amazing. Follow her on Instagram a lot. I'm always using her videos. She loves soccer and she is always just playing soccer. And I've actually had some good conversations with her dad about just letting her be free and do these things as long as possible. Cause you know, you get to that age, you start getting recruited, Oh, well now I need to get to the gym. Now mm. I need to be strong and that can take away from this. So you can just see her strong landing and just that nice little release all the time. She's constantly expressing these things and you can always interrupt me too, by the way. Just, I, I oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I got a couple of clips of her cause she works a lot on her, her touches, but it's through, it's through play. Mm -hmm. It's through her, her practice, her repetitions around other people, those different situations. And even when she's celebrating, I think, I don't know if it's this one, but so light on her feet, no heels down, no collapsing inside, just really strong and confident in every touch she has. And even when she celebrates, you know, she's not pulling an Achilles or having an Achilles shred celebrating. Yeah, exactly. It's a very, very common thing that happens. That was non-contacts. People go to celebrate and then. Well, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> so she's really fun to watch. I have just, I'm always like filming her and you can see not every step is the most perfect step, but she's so res resilient. She's able to move off the ball. She's able to move her body very freely too. Mm -hmm. Boop. Just whipping around, just whipping around. Yeah, that's right. So this little guy, um, I put him up recently and this is flag football, so not football, football, but man, mm -hmm. he move his chest being able to rotate just so free and he's holding something too, which makes it hard, but he's still able to just articulate from the ground footwork little, I'd probably clean that up a little bit with his landing, but he's moving forward and he's so backside that again, we don't have to be perfect 
because he's got such free movement moving forward, essentially. Mm-hmm. He's very confident in that. So I've got some female athletes, some some girls here. We've got Sophia Smith working. And again, just kind of light touches off the ball, driven by her glutes, really strong footwork. I like watching a lot of soccer too, because everyone is just, you can usually see this, that full whip. It's almost like a whip that we can actually yeah, yeah, exactly. feel it from the feet. And then the body, upper body just moves with it so nicely. There's, there really is not this robotic movement. If someone is moving really well, really, really well on the ball or off the ball, especially, uh, Gabby from, I think he's, is he on Barcelona right now? Yeah. 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 He, uh, one of my guys sent me this video too of hit some of his training. So seeing him move off just even in a, this is like a warm up run. Yeah. But again, just really nice footwork, big out loading, big bow setting, like kind of a late, late drop in with it. And then able to get all the way around to complete the stride really nicely. So that was kind of fun watching him just, I wish did I have it in real time. So just really that good, strong forward lean, hips back, moving forward. That was cool to see. He put that up on TikTok. Or Barcelona nice. did. And so then I just have a couple common soccer players or videos. Because for me, I feel like, especially with athletes, the more volume you see of film and pictures, yeah. the more it'll resonate. The more you'll start to see those patterns. It's very hard right off the bat. That's how I, my awareness continued to build in my experience over time, coaching and training myself and others was high volume. So like I said at the beginning, whether it's children, whether it's the indigenous, whether it's the elderly or the elite athletes, just start to intake, find your favorite players and just start watching how they move. Yeah. And so yes, film is great. And I definitely stick to the film. Film is like the best way to just see what's happening out there. But sometimes it's nice to show people for the first time because we'll talk spirals or bows and corners, like we said, and they don't, they don't know what I'm talking about. So actually showing pictures can help. And you can really see like even this, this celebration, this crazy bow and that outside edge loading uh, on the foot here and a lot of nice synchronization. So as he's moving, everything just synced up, whether it's uh, in training getting around the flag, pivoting off that strong part of the foot, not mm-hmm. giving, I, I call them flat tires. So no flat tire inside, yeah. no balance, no collapsing, not about to come off that flag and tear his ACL. Elbows very free, big side bending here. So again, just not being braced, just really strong yeah. and fluid. And then I think I have a few more here, just a couple pictures just to get visuals. Madison Hammond, uh, I think she's on the US now, but She's been having some, even from college, just expressing really nice movement and strong synchronization of her, Mm -hmm. of her body, whether she's moving off the ball or has the ball here. Just if you can preserve this as much as possible, this is the opposite of what we're seeing when female athletes are athletes are making contact to the ground or changing direction and ACL. This usually collapses inside. This goes with it and it's just a hot mess. So you want to load out and back. It's kind of, Seems really simple, but I know it's hard sometimes to get there, but it really is so much simpler than it seems. I know Greenwood has been having some legal issues going yeah. on yeah, on the true. side, but his movement is pretty clean, especially this yeah. one I've trained. I mean, man, just so whippy with it. So you can really see just, I mean, chest, big bow, big corner. It's just really expressive. So again, I know yeah. there's some other things going on on the side, which is unfortunate, but he does move really well, really, really well. I think there's a couple more. And these are just a couple comparisons that you can see that, okay, poor loading, really mm-hmm. strong, optimal loading. This is going to keep your joint safe. This is probably going to cause some irritation and destruction. Yeah, so yeah for sure. Avoid that non-contact couple here too. Just same kind of where is the energy moving? Where is the pressure favoring? And can we stay strong in the optimal patterns? I think I Cool. That's about it. I could talk about that all day. So I want to make sure I don't <laughs> word about it. Oh, yeah. Too much, I know that was know, fantastic, but... Carly. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun to just get people. And that's why you do such a great job on your platform, exposing things and showing and getting people to see. Like the, we can have the conversation, but the first thing is that awareness piece. And so having a lot of examples, I, I'm sure you do too. I have a lot of I have folders of yeah, good, lots of stuff. Bad. 
and it starts to accumulate and you just, oh my gosh, it's insane. Like, how do we not see this? <laughs> how is this missing? But you know, it's part of the, part of the puzzle. How do we get that out there more, more awareness? So, yeah, it's a whole, uh, <laughs> kerfuffle we'll say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. that was, yeah, yes. Carly, that, that was amazing. Thank you so much for, uh, showing that analysis i think the more you look at these patterns that obviously are there hidden in plain sight we'll say then right the the sooner you can get to that yeah. in yourself and i've seen it for myself right. especially in myself the more work i've done to become glute dominant facile driven and move in this patterns the more obvious it is when you see it in in other oh. people Always and because say, because, you because like it, you can feel you it you know yeah yep yeah, absolutely. Once you see it, once you feel it, there's really, it's, it's just no going back. Someone the other day asked me, um, but don't you miss the barb, the deadlift? Like, don't you, you can tell me like, don't, don't you miss you, it? Yeah. You can admit it. Don't you miss the deadlift? I, I do not miss my back always hurting and my form was. Oh, the best. Yeah. At some point. So I just don't miss what that made me feel like away from that setting. And it really is, it's like now that, you know, you are glute, fascial driven, glute dominant, doors open, doors get blown wide open to do a lot of different things. Because mm -hmm. when you are, are expressing your natural athleticism, you are moving pain-free, you are living your best life, then you can do whatever you want. And so many options, go hiking, go running, go, go do, I recently, I'm pretending like I know what I'm doing, but I recently tried some, some jujitsu uh, recently. There's like uh -huh. an all women's class, especially for self-defense purposes. But I know that the inputs there are not ideal for my body, but at least with the awareness, I know how to get back to neutral. If I do yeah. feel things that are taking me out of it, I know how to get back to moving really well and feeling good. So yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's very freeing and empowering to have a, a movement bias based perspective, not just feeding an exercise or blindly following the masses who are oftentimes broken. So <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, that's right. I was broken too. We were both broken, but learn from uh, our experience so that you don't have to learn the hard way. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, like a really good point to wrap up with Carly is, yeah. Um, oftentimes like I get asked, you know, like if you, if you know all this stuff, why aren't you like the best in the world? And I'm like, well, <laughs> like, like <Yeah>. if, <laughs> like, I wouldn't know this stuff if, if I hadn't gone through all the pain and suffering and mistakes mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and like trials and tribulations because right. like, <laughs> it's just not how life and works. Maybe, maybe you, you would know? have been, you know, maybe the opportunity would have been there because you wouldn't have had the ACL tear. Yeah, same yeah. thing I, I think about that all the time like dang i look back like if only like if only i didn't have to but it gets us to this point and that's why we are so passionate and want to share that message with the others absolutely because yeah. so, so hopefully others can avoid yeah. the time yeah. and the pain yeah. and the suffering that yeah. that people like us went through so absolutely yes okay so carly <laughs> where can people find you where can they follow all your amazing content and get to know you better Cool. I'm right now pretty active on Instagram. It's easy to message me there. I, I'm on there a lot and I'll respond really quick. So I live in my stories, I say. So I blast a lot of information, <laughs> my stories, highlights, I, goals. I'm going to strive to be better about posting actual education like that too. So my Instagram is coach.carly. And um, my squad and I also, if you're interested in learning more, I know you have programs available. We have programs mm -hmm. available as well to help you you know, achieve what you need to achieve, get you back to a good place of movement um, at primalmovement.org. So that's kind of where you can find those two, those two options cool. and more information. Mm -hmm. Primal, primalmovement.org, guys, you heard it. Yes. And yeah, reach out, Coach Carly. I, I love connecting with other athletes and just sharing good vibes and good movement. So <laughs> anytime. Fantastic. Well, guys, Thank that was episode uh, 12 of the Purple Tooth podcast. If you guys are on Spotify or um, iTunes, Apple Music, the full actual video is on YouTube as well. So go on there, give it a give it a like, give it a comment and subscribe, of course. Carly, again, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the future. Yeah. All right. <laughs>